Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is environment and user interface. Now, this workshop is in a different format. I've never actually done it in exactly this way before. But we've, I've been bundling all the materials into projects in RStudio and we'll make extensive use of RStudio projects. Um, that has the great advantage that you can easily download the files from where I post them on GitHub. <clears throat> everything is in one place, everything is included, hopefully, and everything should just work out of the box. Um, but let's spend a moment to figure out where to put the project files to keep things organized. So I'd like to talk a little bit about organizing your hard drive and organizing project directories. I've put some slides here on, on, on Google Slides and there's a link here if you want to follow along on your own computer that link should work for you. So <clears throat> there's many ways to organize um, your large hard drives on your computer. Um, what I find works really well for me is not to organize things by um, things like postdoc work or um, specific locations I've worked in, but by themes. Because I, I usually find if I, if I organize by dates, um, the project takes significantly longer than the date that I've anticipated and then my folder name isn't really relevant anymore and it's much harder to find. In terms of themes, I, I find over the years that as remembering things gets more difficult, I still am able to keep up with the things that I do need to remember. So for example, um, you might have very top level teams like current work that you're working on, administrative work of which we all have too much to do, research work which we'd actually like to do, some things we need to take care of at home, resources of a more general nature, and so on and so on. And if we are um, particular about keeping these in a particular order in our directory listing, we, I, I like to prefix things with just numbers so that they're listed in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, one of the advantages of the numbers is that um, on the terminal level, I don't usually need to type out the top level directories because I know what the number is and then I can just use tab to complete them once I put the first two numbers in. So it's fast. Um, <clears throat> this folder current or something like current, um, that's something I increasingly use. I just put alias to the actual work that I'm doing at the moment in there and I have my main files in their hierarchy where they belong but I also have them immediately accessible um, as a shortcut. And if you have something like research and computational biology and training, um, that might be a folder where your, your workshop materials can go into. Something, you know, thematically you might have, you might distinguish between training, your actual projects, and again, resources of a general nature. Now, I think you probably all have some kind of a training directory, um, CBW directory, or whatever you've called it. If you haven't, it's going, it would be really useful if you make one now in a location where you can easily find it. Because we'll be using this directory as basically the staging ground for all of the RStudio projects. So at some point you'll have a home directory, the first top level directory uh, that your computer uses. Um, <clears throat> on, on Macs, um, this, is, this is basically the top level home directory. On, on Windows computers, I'm I'm always confused. You have to, I have to apologize. I know very, very little about Windows computers at all. So when you, there's probably a, a C colon slash and your username or where does a Windows computer usually, um, what does it consider as your home directory? Anyway, you can figure it out. We'll find how to figure it out um, in, in, in a short moment. Um, <clears throat> Now, a training directory could contain uh, collect workshops, tutorials, and other training resources. When we download a project and create a new project in RStudio, this is the folder or directory where the project is going to be located in, 
and then everything that belongs to the project is going to be subsequently um, put into a, its own folder within that directory where it remains accessible. So let's give that a try. Let's install the first project. Um, I'd like you to open our studio and basically we'll be working only with our studio in this workshop. Um, the functionality is 99.9% .9 the same as R itself. R Studio is essentially a graphical user interface for R, but it's also more than a graphical user interface. It's also something we call an IDE, an integrated development environment, because it supports writing code and, and working with code. So open R Studio. probably should look something like this. Now select File New Project and I don't want to save. There are several ways to create a new project. Um, the way that we'll work with projects during this workshop is to use version control and download files and assets from GitHub. So we click on version control and we select clone a project from a Git repository. And then we want the repository URL. So <clears throat> you can copy and paste this. This is the repository URL for the first steps here. And Next, we need to find the directory which I've just previously called the training directory. And we browse for that. And um, and click on open to have it selected. So this is the subdirectory in which um, the project is going to be installed and this middle name of the project directory name will autofill if you just click into it or use your arrow keys to go back into it. I don't know why it doesn't automatically autofill when this is first copied into the, into the field here. So now you should have all these three um, fields populated and then just click on create project and that's what it should look like. Being able to work with version control on your computer is really really essential uh, for your own work. One of the one of the big problems that uh, the age of large data has brought upon us is the question of reproducibility. You publish something and then your data changes and how are you ever going to reproduce what you've done previously? So one of the strategies to solve that is to extensively work with project scripts, our project scripts and our projects that keep everything bundled that you're currently working on and keeping um, basically running everything through a script, not using the command line, not using um, uh, point and click interfaces, but making sure that the entire analysis that you're doing is reproducible from the first line of the script to the last line of the script. Not, not in the least because you're going to submit your manuscript and then the reviewers are going to want some change and then you're going to scratch your head and, and try to figure out how the hell did I actually make that plot and spend a lot of time on that. So if it's all bundled in a script and you can just rerun it, you'll save a lot of time. But importantly, you'll also be able to reproduce things. However, of course, if you change your script and uh, then something breaks, what are you going to do then? And this is where version control comes in. If your script, as in these projects, is under version control and you commit your changes regularly, you can go back in time to a previous working version and recover or to a previous working version that you've published previously and reproduce the results that you got at that time. So version control is really essential in the digital age. 
we need to keep, we need to be accountable for our research and we need to keep essentially a paper trail of what we're doing this is why we're working this this way other than that, and that other than that of course it's a very very convenient way especially working through github to share code to share materials with everybody on your team or in your lab and this is what i i hope to be introducing you uh, to you today um, how convenient this can be to have everything packaged and then you can just download it from github of course only if it actually works so we'll work out how how to um, get our computers to do what they ought to do now <clears throat> you in the once you open our studio with this project you'll see three or, or perhaps four open panes we these are pains like in window pane, not pain as in frustration. Um, and in these panes, you have different tabs. So I will be using the, the words panes and tabs to refer to this. This is the console pane, um, where we have an interactive console into which we can just type our commands and have them executed. Um, this is the environment pane, and there are several tabs here that allow you to look at what I've done previously or what functions uh, and data sets are currently loaded. And this is a supporting pane, for example, that lists our files, that has plots, if any are generated, um, that lists the available and loaded packages within R, and so on. Oh, and importantly, also uh, the help functions. Now, here's a bundle of files now that, um, that we've loaded to to support this. Git ignore is something you don't usually need. Um, it's simply a file that tells the program Git which files should not be under version control. Things you don't want placed under version control are large binary files. Version control works incrementally, but it only works on text files. So you have a text file, you change something, and Git remembers the change and doesn't simply store the entire file again. This makes it efficient also for large files. But it can't do that for large binary files. So if you have your, your um, original reads in a, in, a, in, a, in a BAM format, and you change something there in, in, in some way, and you upload that, you will need the entire file stored over and over again. So by editing git ignore, we can just uh, tell it things that should not be under version control. So things I don't place under version control is the R history file, um, the R project file, and, and some other things. Um, but this is automatically done and already supplied. Now, when the project starts up, the first file that's e that gets executed is a file called .r profile. And that's important. This file can contain all of your configuring information. So, for example, if you want an initial function uh, loaded here, um, you, could, you could put it into our profile. Now, I needed to circumvent a little uh, quirk of our studio in order to enable us to actually load the R script which we are using throughout this workshop or this part of the workshop. Typically, I would simply put a command file.edit the file that I need into my R profile. And then when R gets loaded or R Studio gets loaded, it should open that file. However, it doesn't actually work because R Studio uses its own editor. So it won't recognize file.edit early on. It's an unknown function for R Studio. So there's a detour here. Within R profile, I've um, defined a function which simply sources an R script. So when R starts up, this R script is sourced and you execute that function or you are prompted to execute that function. So this is why the console asks you welcome and type init to begin. So we type init and then the function is loaded and that function now loads my script file, r intro environment.r. This is the script that we'll be working with. Maybe 
a later version of our studio will at some point uh, not require this workaround, but for now uh, the workaround helps us open this file. Okay, now these script files are meant to read along and type along as we go through this. Um, this is your script. Put your notes in there. Put comments in there. You don't have to comment out things, but you can, you can simply type in them. Since you are not sourcing or executing that, that won't generate errors. But put copious notes and, and questions to us and all information that you need into these files. If anything changes in, in that file, um, you, uh, this turns red and at some point you, you can just save it in the normal way. Okay, um, so let's talk briefly about the graphical user interface or the integrated development environment. So I've told you about the four panes. Um, one thing that can be very useful and, and help for quick and correct coding is command comp completion. So what does command completion mean? It means you can type part of a command and our studio will give you a number of choices how that whatever you type could possibly be continued. So if I want get wd for get working directory, um, I get all choices that begin with get or constrain them if I type four characters. And then I can simply click on that to complete the command. This is especially useful if you're not entirely sure whether the R command is written in camel case, or in dot format, or even in pothole case. So camel case is words that are strings of lowercase characters, and in between them have some uppercase characters to separate the words. The dot version is um, with dots in between, and the pothole case is with underscore uh, in between. Unfortunately, R is really, really inconsistent about what they use. Is um, read lines in camel case, or with dots, or with pothole case? I don't know, but if I need it, um, I see lots of versions with dots, and I see lots of versions with camel case, and read lines that I was thinking of is one with camel case. So it's comparatively easier to find the correct version. If you're typing something and it, you're typing it partially and it doesn't pop up here, it's unknown to the system. So you've probably mistyped something. Another great advantage is that you immediately get a synopsis of the command syntax. So uh, essentially the parameters that you, that you need to add. So get wd, for example, does not have parameters. It's a function that simply gets the local current working directory. However, if I say something like set wd, it has one parameter, dir, um, for the directory. Is this all too small for the people in the back? OK. So, yeah, uh, did you all type get wd? What does it say? Is it the top level directory of where you actually place the folder? Okay, this is, this is amazing because um, something that really seems to work is that when I saved the project, of course, when I write the project, it's all relative to my own hard drive. So how does it know about the structure of your hard drive, and I've defined to set the working directory to the project directory. And apparently it remembers that well enough to make that stable. Okay, so the working directory is automatically set to the project directory. You are aware of the difference between home directory and working directory? No? So the home directory is the one where you log in. The working directory is the 
current directory that R uses. And if it's set to the project directory, it's the directory that contains all of these files here. Um, okay. So here's a little task. Type sys in the console, get a list of system-related functions, have a brief look at what system-related functions they are, find sys.time, use the tab to autocomplete and execute it. <clears throat> so Andrew just mentioned something um, that's important for you to know. Uh, a complete function command in R requires um, the open and closing parentheses even if there is no required function argument. So if we say get wd, this has the expected result. If we leave out the, the parentheses, that interprets this string here as a request for getting the contents of this R object. R functions are objects, and if I simply give it that name, I get displayed the contents of that object. So for get wd, I get information this is a function, and I can't actually get the contents of that function because it's a compiled function for which I don't have the source code available here. If I use the init function that I had before, like this, I get the actual function code that the init function is defined with. So if you actually want to execute a function, don't forget the parentheses. And if you get something funny, um, then you did forget the parentheses. Just add them. OK, so what does sys.time do? Gives us the current time. So if you ever need to change your working directory, um, the syntax is the path to your directory. Note that this requires a string of the path to your directory. Um, if your directory has blank spaces in the directory name, you have to escape them, i.e. put a backslash in front of the space. Um, if the directory is correctly set, then this command, list files, should list the files that are um, in our main directory here, in our working directory. Do you notice a oops? Do you notice a discrepancy between this list and this? Do I get the same files? Am I in the right directory? Some files are omitted. Yeah, what what's omitted? Everything that starts with a dot. In Unix environments, everything that starts with a dot is considered a hidden file. So it's, it doesn't normally appear in directory listings. Um, you can tweak your computer. I'm sure you can also do this with Windows computers, but you can tweak your computer to always include these files because if you're programming, you often need the, the so-called dot files too. Um, <clears throat> but even if they're not listed, you can always um, you can always access them. So for example, I can say file.edit.r profile. And even though our profile is not listed in this list here, um, I can access it, open it, and uh, edit its contents if required. So if you know the name of a file, you don't necessarily need to see it in a directory listing. Um, Now, if you define paths in Windows, normally you would use backslashes. And however, on a Unix level on which uh, R and R Studio are built, the backslash has a special uh, significance. The backslash is a so-called escape character. So if you have a backslash T, this doesn't necessarily mean there's a backslash and then a T. It means a tab character. If you have a backslash N, it means a new line character. 
and so on. So expressions of paths in Windows using the backslash, as you normally would use them in Windows, don't work in exactly the same way. However, conveniently, R will translate this for you. If it recognizes that you really mean a path here, then you can simply use the forward slash and it will translate this into a backslash as it sends out the system command. So even though you're used to backslash syntax for Windows computers, for our purposes, you can always use forward slashes if needed. In my script files, I usually write set wd, whatever path is the first command, just to make sure that I'm in the right directory, which often otherwise I'm not. Okay, now something, small things about making your life easy when typing in the console and the editor. When you type a quotation character, quotation mark, RStudio automatically complements that with a second one and places this in the middle, places the cursor in the middle. Um, similarly, if I use single quotes, same thing. Similarly, if I use parentheses, square brackets, or curved braces, all of these are auto-completed to a second character and the cursor is in the middle. And this is really convenient because usually, you, you know, when you start typing a function of sorts and all your commands have to go, and if you don't have this usually, then at the end you forget having a... Um, a curvy brace and then you're in for a session uh, trying to debug where where you forgot to actually put the brace which might not be obvious now one problem is though that if i type a command uh, or if i have a multi-line command that that i execute and i haven't closed this say like this here and then i press return it expects me to continue this and it doesn't stop. This is especially often the case if I just copy some, coast, some code from somewhere and I forget to include all the balanced uh, braces or brackets or quotation marks. In this case, I simply type escape and that escape gets me out of this particular um, um, sand trap again. And um, one more thing that, that um, is useful when working with the console and the editor is the history function. Within the console, we can use up arrow and down arrow keys to um, go through commands. But the entire history of a, of a session is also recorded. Um, in the history tab of the environment pane where all the commands are. Now this is useful because it's not uh, not just there for reading, I can actually access these commands and execute them. But it's up to you to figure out how, just give that a try. So I, I presume at some point you've typed sys.time, so access the history tab and execute it again. Double click on it Okay, and this loads it in the console, and then I just simply press return to execute it again. Any other options? Right. I've never actually done this. I see this for the first time, so I always learn something new, but apparently I can click to console. And um, if I use shift, I can select more things. Now you can save your history and by default R would save your history and then reload it the next time you open a project. Um, I always turn this off but I'd like to show you where it's turned on and off. I always turn this off because I believe that the script itself should be the history. So everything you do, everything that's meaningful should actually be contained in the script and I don't rely on a second file that can go out of sync in some way with the script to contain information. 
So I never load environments when I started. I, I like to start with a blank environment, no functions defined. All the functions should be in the script, and I don't load history. The, the script itself should be the history. But if you ever want to change that behavior, which I've turned off uh, for all the projects that we use in the workshop, go to Project Options, and this says uh, Restore Art Data into Workspace, and you can either say Yes or Default, Save Workspace to Art Data on Exit, or Always Save History, even if not saving Art Data, and so on. So basically, Art Data is a compressed format that contains um, all of the current environment, um, your currently defined variables and data sets that you've loaded in memory, they would be stored with your session. But as I said, I've, I've turned these off. Okay, using scripts. Now, you can simply type R commands in the console, and this is convenient because you can work through history, and, but it's uh, much better to actually use scripts. And I'm, I strongly believe all your R work should always go into scripts. And ideally, um, it's probably going to be useful if all your R work always goes into projects. Um, <clears throat> so, oops, this is wrong. It's not the assets folder. I've deleted this. This project contains a sample script, and that is script template.r. This is a template that I usually use to write my own scripts. And it's a bit wordy to begin with, but if I discipline myself and I actually fill in the, the information there, um, I find life really rewards me for that because there's just less stuff I have to remember and it's easier for me to figure out, especially if I do some development here, some development there. Um, things can become very confusing and it's, it's much, much easier to keep track. So a little digest of what this is for, um, a little note on a version that's actually quite important because um, you're going to develop things and refine them and if you keep track of the different versions it's easier to to make sense of what state of your development you were in when um, you were working with this date and author especially author if you want to share your script with someone so they know who to blame for errors um, input output and dependencies so input is um, what you need to even run this. Output is what you hope to get out of it. Dependencies are things like uh, packages that you need to load or specific resources that you need somewhere on your computer. You might make a note of things that you still want to develop later in, in a section of to-do. Uh, you might um, want to, you certainly should make notes of things that don't work as expected or uh, as they should and put them in there. As the first command, usually uh, set working directory to your project directory, especially if you're not using um, an RStudio project. Then I split things into parameters, packages, and functions. Parameters. These are all the numbers and file locations and other information that you need to run this in the first place. So <clears throat> these parameters should go here and they should have a little comment. It's very very uh, confusing if you have magic numbers. So in your code below when you when you write your code some maybe the, the number 7.1 uh, appears and three weeks down the line you will not remember what that 7.1 was about and whether it's even the right number. So you, you put something like that up here and say um, um, scale is 7.1 just to make something up multiply measurements with previous. So in, in this way you keep a record of what you're doing and why. Um, 
if you if you don't put information like that into a common and convenient spot, nobody's really going to be able to understand your code when you pass it on to someone. And the worst case always is if the person you pass it on and who can't understand it is yourself half a year down the line. So embarrassing. It happens all the time. So try try to work against that. So all parameters should be explained here, and really to rerun the script with slightly different uh, parameters, this section should be the only one that you ever want to edit. <clears throat> now, um, packages. There's a very, very large number of additional functionalities for R which are available through packages, and uh, we've I think you've encountered packages in the introductory tutorial. Uh, we'll be casually loading packages and working with them as we go along. The paradigm which I usually use to code for packages in a script is the following. If the package is not installed, obviously, I want to install it. After it's installed, I still need to load it with the library command. So loading a package has minimally one, but possibly two components to it. Minim the minimal part is to issue the library command to actually make the package available, but the package may not yet reside on your computer, so you might have to install it with this here. Note, um, a frequent source of confusion is that the package name here is a string, i.e. it's in quotation marks, but here it is simply the label of an R object and therefore requires no string. So install packages and library of the package is something that usually goes into our scripts. Now I don't want, if I, ought, if I basically run the entire script all at once, I don't want to go back and install and reinstall the packages all the time. So I use this little construction here and there is a command that's very similar to library and that command is require. But that command has an output value, and that output value is logical, true, or false. So if, the if loading the library is successful, require will give me a logical true. If this command is not successful, it will give me a logical false. Now, why would it not be successful? Well, Obviously, the most common reason is that the package was never installed on your computer. So, <clears throat> what this says is, if the command is successfully loaded, the output of this command is true, and this is the logical negation operator. So, if not true, then go through installing the package. However, if it is true, that require has worked, then skip this whole um, skip this whole section and then it's it's just installed. The string quietly means don't give me any feedback about what you're doing, but this only refers to when I'm actually sourcing, sourcing it. So quietly will prevent you from having to go through lots of checks in your output when you source the file or when you run the entire script all at once. When you run this interactively, it doesn't work in quite the same way. Um, you will still get this function to complain that it wasn't uh, installed in the first place. So if I, <clears throat> if I simply run this function here, our unit apparently isn't installed, so it installs it and loads it. And then it gives me the warning message that there is no package called our unit. Well, that's actually not no longer true at that point. That's something that you have to be aware of. At that point, it was installed and it was loaded. But after it was done doing that, it basically went up the stack and said, what was I doing previously? I was previously trying this um, require function. And that gave me a warning. And now I'm going to print out the warning because I have time to do so. So by the time this warning comes in, um, it's no longer current. So when you, when you go through this particular paradigm of loading packages, be aware, you may get a warning, which doesn't mean it wasn't successful. 
Can I go through that again? Okay. So basically, if I if I go through this here, the first task um, R needs to do is to execute this require function, i.e. it tries to load the library. If it notices it fails doing the library, it goes to the inside of this if statement and installs the package and then explicitly loads the library. By that time, the library is loaded. So it's done. So it goes back to the outside, the, the containing uh, command. And the containing command then says, uh, well, the last thing we were doing created a warning. So let's just put out the warning now. So it, it deferred issuing the warning. It didn't put the warning, it didn't print the warning immediately when it encountered the warning. So that deferred warning then appears. However, by the time it appears, it's no longer current because not only uh, is there a package, we've installed it and, and loaded it by that time. <clears throat> Now, quietly is supposed to um, suppress this, um, but it only does so when I run this automatically in a script. When I run it interactively, the quietly doesn't work in the same way, so I still get the warning printed. And then you see this, you might think something went wrong, but in fact, everything is OK. And how do you confirm that something? I can go to packages, and I see that our unit is installed and loaded. Okay, in the next section of my uh, script template, I define functions. Um, I've in the next unit, I've uh, created a separate file um, for a function template. But um, you can, in this section, you would source external files or define functions. Nothing actually happens here, uh, except that you go through code that makes functions available. And we'll be working more with, with, with functions as we go along. So a typical function, again, is commented with its purpose, its parameters, and the resulting values. And then comes the actual process, the step-by-step -step process of your project, where you go through your, your commands one by one and run them and load data and transform data and create plots and write output and, and so on. And there's a little section um, for function tests. Um, testing is really important, but that's all I'll say about testing for the purposes of this workshop. Um, if, you're more, if you're interested more in how to test and why to test, um, there's a very, very good supporting series of um, computer and programming literacy called um, Software Carpentry. So Software Carpentry has um, versions uh, that are taught in R and versions that are taught in Python and they talk a lot about version control, why version control, how version control, testing, and so on. All the little things that um, you need to ensure that your the work that you're doing uh, doesn't just run, but is hopefully also correct and reproducible. Okay. Now, instead of typing things in the console, I type everything into my script. With that, then, I have a record of what I've been doing. Um, I can go back easily and refine things and change things and rerun them. But, of course, um, if I would type things here and then have to copy and paste them into the console, that would be very awkward and, and hard to work with. Fortunately, there's a different way. In the script files, we can select things and then execute them. So if you place your cursor into a line and then press, press um, Command Return on the Mac or Control R on Windows computers, and I hope this works on Windows computers, as I said, um, that particular line is then executed.
And if I select a whole line, again, everything that's selected is executed. Now this is really useful because often um, <clears throat> R is a functional language and often we, we take results of one function directly as inputs for another function. So the directory function, in this case, gives me a directory listing of all files that end with dot capital R. And I pass that directory listing to the length function. Now if I want to unravel this and, and look at the nested structure here, I can simply select the inner part, press command enter, then only the inner part gets executed. So in this case, this produces a vector of three strings, i.e. the three file names that start with this pattern. Note that the pattern expands to our project, so it's not only our files proper that have been used here. And the length function then tells me that this resulting vector is three elements long. So I have three files which match that pattern. <clears throat> if you want to um, select more than one line, you can select an entire block. Uh, this is a for loop. You've actually seen this previously when I used the, the if statement to load a package. So this entire for loop here is then executed in one go. Okay, now I'd like you simply to to be able to easier work with, with files and, and make a copy of the script template in your R resources directory. If you don't have an R resources directory, it might be a good time to create one. So where you keep things that you generally often access, like a script template, like a function template, like um, this file here, a PDF, which is a short reference to R commands, so things which, you know, thematically belong together as supporting your work with R. Okay. So one of the great things about R is that it has an enormous scope of possibilities and of functions that you can work with. This is also one of the downsides of R. Um, essentially, the problem is that there's so much to learn about R that it's pretty much absolutely impossible to remember everything about R that there, that there is to remember. By the time that you've essentially studied, um, say, all the, all, the fi all the programs on bioconductor that have something to do with uh, large-scale genome analysis, um, so many new files have been added and so many new options have been added that things become very difficult. So there's a few ways to, to, to work around that. Um, the most basic help file is accessed by simply typing a question mark and the name of the command that you want help for. This is equivalent to typing help and then the command in quotation marks, but this is a shorthand for the same thing. This opens the help file in this in this assets pane here <clears throat> and it tells you the proper command name and uh, its correct parameters. This is then explained here. All the arguments or parameters are defined and most importantly, it also tells you the return value, i.e. what that function produces. Now you'll learn very quickly when you work with these that they're correct, but they're not very helpful. Um, often the text of these command files, is, uh, these, these help files, is very terse and very technical. 
I always see a little bit of a paradoxical disconnect there. They're not written for the people who actually need the help. This is programmer's documentation. But if you understand um, Yeah, this is this is a relatively good one, but but many of them um, here on a POSIX file system, recursive listings will follow symbolic links to directories. This is probably not what you were wondering about when you um, when you open this command. So this may be the first and quickest way to get some idea, or simply to fill in some blanks, but it's often not that useful. First of all. Um, it's specific to the exact spelling, and uh, secondly, it's very technical. If you're not quite sure about how that command is named, uh, you can search for entries uh, with that string, and the search results then gives you a number of options. Uh, the package where this particular function appears and uh, what, what it actually does. There's also this option here, the apropos function, which finds all the files that start with dir. So you can put uh, patterns here. So for example, um, these are things that start with dir. If I omit this, I get things that include dir somewhere. So for example, this here, dir in the middle. If I put a dollar sign at the end, I get functions that R knows about that end with dir. So this can be helpful if you say, hmm, was there something with CSV files somewhere in R? comma separated values isn't there something that reads them oh there is right so there's functions both to read and to write uh, CSV files <clears throat> a rather large package um, or a, a rather large amount of information is available through the SOS package um, essentially what this does is it finds keywords in all our packages, not just the ones that are available um, on your computer, and it opens them in a tabular view uh, in your browser. So simply try that at some point. I've put a number of um, other help functions and help options at the bottom of this page here, useful resources. Oh, I should refine that so it actually links to that. So there's a number of things that are really important. So if, if you have a technical question about R, the R help mailing list um, is very, very uh, responsive. Many people are following that mailing list. And usually, if, you, if you're not quite sure how to code something, uh, how to solve a problem, you will get excellent answers in, in very short time. Whenever you request help on a mailing list, however, if this is going to be a pleasant experience for you and, and for those who answer, there's a little bit of homework that you need to do. And that little bit of homework is you need to structure your question and ask it in a way, try to imagine that somebody is asking you that question and ask, do I actually have all the information I need to answer that question? Ideally, you would construct what is called an MWE, a minimal working example. So don't upload your BAM files, but make something very small with maybe 10 lines that produces the problem that you're encountering and that people can reproduce on, on their own computer. Invariably, if they're able to you know, go through you know, six or seven lines of code and reproduce the problem, um, you will find they go into puzzle mode and they will drop whatever they're doing currently and uh, have a beautiful um, half an hour of procrastination and find the most elegant way to solve your problem for you um, 
with everybody else in the community to see, so the peers can then congratulate them and say, this is a really nice solution and, and well done. And incidentally, this is, also, um, this is also a great way to learn and to keep current with, with issues of R. So this is the R help mailing list, and um, <clears throat> Stack Overflow works in a, in a similar way. The key to get good answers is a minimal working example and spending some time in asking yourself whether you've described your problem well enough. Now, if you're simply looking for things, I find these days I, I really don't need any other tools but Google. I just Google R and then whatever, and Google seems either to have learned from my browsing habits that when I say R, I mean the R uh, statistical workbench and programming language. And it's so rare these days that I need to go to the second or third page of Google results before I find what I need. It's amazing. If you have a legitimate question, chances are 99.9% .9 somebody else will have had that question before you and somebody will have answered that question. There's a specialized search engine for our topics um, and that's especially useful <clears throat> if by chance um, the term that you're searching for brings up large numbers of irrelevant hits, um, which, which is possible. You know, if, if the function is named something that also has a colloquial meaning, somehow you can get tons of irrelevant hits. Then you can go to rseq, which is a specialized search engine only for our topics, http rseq.org. Most packages that we use are either downloaded from CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, at that link, or from Bioconductor. Bioconductor is a large collaborative project that um, writes and maintains computational resources, R-related computational resources for um, molecular biology, especially large-scale uh, genomics and, and proteomics work. And one thing that's, that's worth browsing over is the Bioconductor task views or the CRAN task view collection where the large amount of functionality that R and, and Bioconductor provide are, uh, is, is made available in a thematic arrangement. So if you want to know something about, uh, say, hypothesis testing or, or um, nonlinear regression, you are possibly going to be able to find good good resources there. So these are just some links. Um, by default, um, just Google for your answers and that will usually help. So with that, I'd like to leave you for your coffee.